Welcome to The Point. I'm your host, Anna Kasparian, and as you guys can expect, we're going to have another great show for you today. We're going to talk about a variety of topics, including Kanye West debuting one of his new songs called uh, New Slaves, and he talks about private prisons, which is interesting. You don't usually expect that from someone like Kanye West. We're also going to talk about a gun mandate in a town in Colorado. Also, injuries that uh, athletes suffer in the NFL. We always talk about concussions, but what about other injuries that follow these people for the rest of their lives? And of course, we're going to do Off Their Feed, which is our new segment where we take tweets from the week and we make judgments about them. Now, uh, the long discussion that we're going to have on the show today has to do with privacy, and I think it's important to do so, especially considering the Department of Justice scandal uh, involving the AP. I mean, is this something that's new or is it something that we've been experiencing for quite some time now? And here to help me have that discussion is our amazing panel. We start with Peter Biebring, who is a senior staff attorney who handles privacy-related cases for the ACLU of Southern California. You do important work. Thank you for coming here and helping us with this discussion. Thanks for having me. We have Dave Rubin. You guys are familiar with him by now. He's a comedian and the host of the newest TYT network show, The Rubin Report. My credits are not as impressive. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I was like, is, girl, when I went to college. The, the, the problem is, you know, the audience already knows how incredible you are. Uh, you know well, what I mean? You don't, you don't need a big introduction. Uh, Peter is new, so. Very. Uh, and then Desi Doyen, again, a regular here at The Point. She's the co-host uh, of... Uh, the nationally syndicated radio show Green News Report, and of course you do the show with Brad Friedman, and she's a regular fill-in host here at TYT. Good to be here. Good to see you. All right, so let's get right to our discussion. We go to the first video who was sent to us by Trevor Tim of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He makes a lot of great points when it comes to our privacy rights. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Trevor Tim. I'm a digital rights activist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a civil liberties organization based in San Francisco. My point today is that our digital privacy is unfortunately uh, succumbing to increased government surveillance and a lot of times the surveillance is happening without a warrant in what we think is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. So for example, our email, despite the fact that email is over 20 years old and that we use it more than we use physical mail at this point, uh, the, there is a law in the books that says that email over six months old does not need a warrant uh, for the government to get it. Now, this is contrary to the content of our phone calls and the content of physical mail. Uh, yet for some reason Congress has yet to change this law. Uh, the same thing goes with a lot of our cell phone conversations, uh, uh, what we call metadata. So where, where you call to, who calls you, how frequently you call them, um, all of this information the Justice Department thinks they can get it without a warrant. We've seen this problem occur in the AP uh, subpoena controversy where the government went ahead and got their two months of call records from 20 phone lines. Uh, without any uh, judge whatsoever. Uh, this is a huge problem when we're talking about our privacy. So here at AFF, we want to fight back. We want, in the courts, we want to convince judges that uh, this information needs to be protected uh, by the Fourth Amendment, and we want to convince Congress and state legislatures that they should pass laws to update how we protect privacy in the digital age. Great video sent to us by Trevor. I want to thank him for doing so. Um, but. I do also want to bring the, the point or make the point that our privacy has been violated for a long time now. It's not something new. It's not something that came up with the Associated Press or the Department of Justice uh, obtaining records from the Associated Press. It's been happening since the Bush administration and the warrantless wiretapping that was happening under his administration. You're seeing it with uh, drones being used for surveillance. You're seeing it with social media collecting our private information and selling it off to third party advertisers without asking us for our permission ahead of time claiming that they're putting it in the terms and conditions without realizing that people are not going to read a 12-page uh, thing that you put up on your website with terms and conditions. So I want to start off with Peter, since this is something that you have um, expertise in. Is this something that Americans are even aware of? I mean, is this something that's just being brought to their attention now? Or do you think that the majority of people in America aren't even paying attention? It's something that people are starting to pay attention to as uh issues, scandals like the AP uh, surveillance have come out. But it's actually something that's a, an evolving problem because the, the technologies that, that lead to this kind of surveillance are really exploding. So, I mean, you mentioned drones, right? Drones is something that's really come up. The technology's only been there for the last few years. And so it's a, it's a new concern that, that we might actually, in the skies over Los Angeles, have police drones that are uh, 
conducting aerial surveillance on people who are not just criminals, not just hot pursuits that we're used to seeing on TV, but law-abiding citizens. Same with, with email. You know, before you know, 2002, it wasn't really a problem uh, that most people had, that, that their entire lives were stored in their inbox with 10,000 messages, if you're anything like me. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it's, it's certainly an issue today. And, and it's one that we're seeing an increasing uh, concern about. So for example, uh, license plate readers. Um, that's something that the technology now exists for police departments, uh, government, to, to put up cameras on police cars or on fixed posts to scan license plates and effectively make a record of where everybody in the city is going. The license plate readers, right, they can stamp the time of day, the place that, uh, that the license plate was scanned. Mm -hmm. People are really concerned about that because that's something that affects not just um, somebody that's a target of a, of a criminal probe, but everybody. It's government compiling a massive database on the movements of law-abiding citizens. Right. So, uh, Dave, a lot of people will make the argument that, well, uh, these license plate readers aren't that big of a deal because if you are in public, uh, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy. What kind of response would you give those people? I mean, this to me is the Terminator. Like, the machines are taking over, and yes, they don't have guns pointed at us, although in the case of the drones, sometimes they do. But all of this technology is happening so fast that we, are ju we just don't know how to stop it at this point. Not all the things that you're describing, we, don't know, we keep getting more email, and we keep opening more digital properties and doing all kinds of stuff, and we just don't know how to control it. And I don't think government in itself is inherently good or inherently bad, but when you create this system, that is just so huge, and then keep giving us more technology, well then of course it's going to be abused, and uh, we probably won't know the repercussions of all of this stuff that we have until, until years from now. So Desi, one big argument is that you know, our legislators just cannot keep up with uh, the rapid evolution of technology and all of these different ways that you know, social media is gathering our information and selling it off to third parties. Um, but do you really feel that legislators care that much about privacy when you hear about surveillance drones and you hear about the Department of Justice uh, doing what they did with the Associated Press? No, actually, I, I don't think they do. I think they care sort of in a general sense, like, like most Americans. They care in a general sense, but they haven't really put much thought into it, and now they're thrust into this position of making these laws when they don't actually understand the technology. I mean, granted, most of us don't have the kind of understanding of the technology and the loopholes and the ways that, these, uh, that this information can be used against us and in illegal ways, even if it's legally accessed. So I don't think that they really have the capacity yet to understand the education, the training, no one's really telling them unless they're uh, what's going on with this technology it has to be reactionary after the fact oh oh now you're telling me that this is what you're able to do with that stuff that we said that you could do earlier and unless the uh, lobbyists who are working for these companies want to educate lawmakers in a way that does not actually cause problems for their profits, mm -hmm. these lawmakers are not going to get that information that they need to protect all of us. Think, think how profoundly Google Glass is going to change everything. A year yeah. from now, we are all going to be wearing these glasses, or two years from now, we're all going to be wearing these glasses where you can record everything. You can be sending an email while you're talking to somebody. Everybody you look at, you could be taking a picture to. The hackers are going to be hacking in to your glasses, and they can be sending video elsewhere and this is the exact example of this what you're talking about the legislators part, yeah. need to sort of be a, ahead of this but how could they how can we they can't do anything although you yeah. know so how can we expect them to be ahead of this although the principles for uh, how to deal with these are, are pretty much the same across technologies right whether you're talking about drones or license plate readers or, or video surveillance cameras on public sidewalks um, the way to deal with with government intrusions is to require government not to collect information on, on law-abiding citizens, to target uh, their collection of data on individuals who they believe, have reason to believe, are engaged in criminal activity. And when they have that reason to believe, they should go and get a warrant. But unfortunately, we're already past that stage. That ship has already sailed, it seems like. It seems like now we have to react after the fact to say, oh, now we have to pass a law that says you actually have to pay attention and, and get a warrant. I, and I think a lot of that has to do with the failure of the media. I mean, Americans were not informed, were not well informed of what was happening under the Bush administration w with warrantless wiretaps. Uh, you know, I know that independent media did its best to share as much information as possible about that, but now that that ship has sailed, I mean, the real question is, is there something that Americans can do to really fight back and regain uh, their privacy rights and make sure that government officials 
officials and law enforcement obtain a warrant in order to do these searches. What do you think, Peter? I, I think so. I mean, I think um, pushing back on these surveillance techniques um, through through legislation like an update of uh, the um, Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which uh, Trevor mentioned, um, and and even on a local level, just by being more aware, I think you blame the media in part, but I think a lot of it also has to do with with local governments not being transparent about what's going on. So you have situations like in Alameda County, um, the local sheriff purchasing drones and and not disclosing that publicly and and uh, subjecting that to kind of a robust public debate, allow people to to decide should we have drones what policies should be put in place. Instead, he's doing it on the sly, and it comes out only after a public records request. Yeah, made. Peter makes a great point about uh, local law enforcement, for instance, not wanting to be transparent. A perfect example of that is, you know, when law enforcement is fighting in the courts to make sure that citizens can't hold them accountable by recording them on their smartphones as they're arresting someone. And I think that's a big problem, especially when you consider the fact that they're public employees. They're paid with our tax dollars. We should be holding them accountable. So the lack of transparency is without a question a huge issue and a big problem with all of this but I want to just quickly discuss what the future of all this will be if it goes unchecked will it finally come to a point where all of our dirty laundry is just kind of out in the open and we become desensitized to it Dave? wouldn't there be something kind of freeing if we ever got to that critical mass where everybody was like oh I'm naked here and that's what I did there and all that I mean in a weird way I guess but I, I really, uh, uh, you know, to go back to the sci-fi thing, I mean, we are, it would be great if we just had a reset button, where now that we sort of understand this stuff, if we could all just have one chance to just reset your digital life and then go, okay, here's all the crazy messages I threw out on Facebook and emails I sent, they're all gonna disappear, and now that I understand what this technology is, here is how I'm gonna use it. But look, in the case of Google Glass, we're all, even, we can all mock it now, but yeah. when it comes out, once your friend has it, you're going to get it too, and then we're all going to be doing it to each other all the time. I know. It's incredible. I mean, it, this is somewhat unrelated, but Google Glass is you know, something that porn companies are now thinking about utilizing when they do their porn shoots because they want to do gonzo porn <laughs> that's like, you know, hands really? off, you don't have to wear it. So there are many possibilities with Google Glasses, but I totally understand what you say. Like, there is a lot of room for abusing that kind of technology. It's going to be and a little problematic. Right. I think that's where the problem is. You know, we can talk about, oh, you know, once everybody dirty laundry is out, then it's going to be fine. But what it doesn't actually account for is the idea of uh, malicious prosecution, political prosecution. For example, Don Siegelman, the Alabama governor who was railroaded by the Bush administration and corrupt judges and is now in prison. You know, he's somebody that this information, you know, that's an example where you could see the information that you have that should normally be kept private, that would have been kept private in the past, can then be used against you or even trumped up and uh, fabricated to be used against you. So that's why we have to be very careful and not, I think, just relax and say, well, it's too late. Nothing we can do. Oh, well, you know, there are other things we can do. We can fight as consumers We can with the corporations whose infrastructure we use for this communication that's essential and necessary to even have a job in today's world. Uh, we can also look at what the EU, the European Union, is doing with their laws. They have much better privacy laws than we have. So we, we can show that it is possible to have it to have these protections be put in place because there's this other you know part of the world that's already doing that you know there are things we can do we just have to fight for those things constantly so what do we do about social media and how a lot of these services are free I mean you go to Twitter you go to Facebook uh, Instagram and you get to use all of these cool services that help you communicate with your friends for free and I guess the trade-off is hey you share your personal private information and you know you allow these corporations or these companies to take that information and sell it to advertisers right so is that a fair argument? Do you feel that it's a fair trade-off, Peter? Well, I think it's a trade-off that, if it's made, has to be made, again, transparently. Mm -hmm. um, corporations have to be clear about what information they're collecting, what information they're sharing, and consumers have to be aware of that and, and demand privacy as, as a built-in uh, ground-level feature of, of the apps they're, they're, they're using. So. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think one thing that we can do also is we can be a little more forgiving to each other when it comes to this stuff because we all got it before we knew what it was. So, you know, Anthony Weiner just I announced. Love that you brought him up. Yeah, Thank I mean, he, I, I'm going to fully back him right now, even though I made a bajillion jokes about him when it all went down. But now he's trying 
to clean himself up. He released this video that I thought was a really, really good video about what he believes in his campaign. And it's like, I was watching all these people from Politico and all these organizations on Twitter make fun of him. And it's like, you know what? We've all done stuff we're not proud Definitely. of. He just happened to step in it and was the first big profile guy to step in it in that digital space. So I think if we're all a little more forgiving and if we all realize that we've all done things that we're not proud of and all that kind of thing, I think that that might make it a little more human at least instead of dealing with just like the legal terms and, and sort of the bigger picture thing. Well, you know, but that's kind of like a social, a social evolution that takes time to, to happen. So, so unfortunately, there are going to be a lot of people whose lives get destroyed or otherwise uh, thrown into disarray because we don't have that social uh, culture yet for that. Like with Google Glass, you know, I think that that's something that the social culture will grow eventually to determine when it's okay to use it, when it's not okay, and a way to prevent people from, you know, using folks' uh, private images against them. Uh, you know, we haven't quite figured that out with Facebook or with any other social media, so I'm not sure exactly how long it will take that evolution to come into place to put these sort of social restrictions in place. but. You know, until then, I think we're all very vulnerable, and it makes me very uncomfortable. Because in the end, people do act differently when they think that they're being watched, when they think they might, they're being recorded, or or their communications might be monitored. And I think a lot of people have this initial instinct: What do I care if I'm not doing anything wrong? But at the end of the day, if you really think that that somebody's going to read that email, listen to that phone call, or or see what you did at the bar. Um, yeah. You're going to behave differently. Absolutely. I mean, I have no interest in living in the Orwellian society where I feel like either the government or some big corporation is watching my every move. But you know, if we need to fight back, we need to fight back. We need to get together and actually do something about this aggressively. Otherwise, get ready for everyone to know what kind of porn you're watching every night after work. Because yeah. that's, that's what it's going to turn into. I mean, let's keep it real. People are going to use that information against one another to undermine one another. And I think that's going to be a complete and utter disaster, especially because of what Desi said about how we're not there socially. We love to pick on people for stupid things that everyone else is guilty of. So shouldn't Anthony Weiner really be the first guy that we all just are like, it's okay? Like, you don't have to like his politics, yeah. and you don't have to vote for him if you live in New York. But maybe he can be the first example of someone that we let it be. You know what I mean? Yes, yeah. the picture's out there. Look, Bill Clinton did stuff, and there aren't pictures, so maybe he got off a, a kind of easy in a way. But I think it would be good for all of us <laughs> Got <laughs> off kind of easy. Uh, <laughs> he got yeah, I think off easy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there was a point there somewhere. All right, right. All right. I'm getting a signal from the producer. I got to go. We got to end this segment. Let's take a very, very quick break. And when we come back, more great stories for you guys, including Kanye West's new song. Welcome back to The Point. Would you expect Kanye West to rap about for-profit prisons? Let's take a look. Country, so you can't see where I stay. So go and grab the report so I can smash his recorder. He try to confuse it with some BS like the New World Order. Meanwhile, the DEA teamed up with the CCA. They try and lock people up, they try and make new slaves. See, that's that probably on prison. Get your peace today. They probably all in the Hamptons bragging about what they made. Fuck the man, your Hampton house. I take your Hampton spouse. Came on a Hampton blouse and in a Hampton mouth. Y'all about to turn it up. I'm about to tear it down. I'm about to what the hell are they gonna say now? All right, say what you want to say about Kanye West. I know he's done some questionable things in the past, but that was an awesome song. And I'm not saying it because it might have sounded good, but I'm saying it because of the lyrics that were in the song, and he brings attention to something that hasn't really been discussed too much by rappers. He talks about private prisons. And of course, rappers do talk about injustices and how um, minorities are targeted for specific crimes, but he specifically talks about the CCA, which is the Cor Corrections Corporation of America. It's the largest for-profit prison company in the United States and just to give you a sense of what he said in the lyrics he said so go and grab the reporters so I can smash their records see they'll confuse us with some bullshit like the New World Order uh, meanwhile the DEA teamed up with the CCA they trying to lock niggas up they trying to make new slaves see that's the private owned prison get your peace today so those lyrics are very blunt, and you know I, I do know that you know some people are aware of what's happening for the for-profit prison industry. Back in the 1980s, to give you guys very quick history on it, we were locking up so many nonviolent drug offenders that our public prisons were overcrowded. You know, municipalities, counties, states—they didn't know what to do. So finally, they allowed these corporations to take over and lock away um, some of these nonviolent offenders. And you know what? There's a lot of money to be made, and they're spending 
a lot of money lobbying to make sure legislators pass tough on crime legislation. So Desi, first question goes to you. Um, what do you think about Kanye getting political in his rap music? Oh, I think it's brilliant. I think it's great. Uh, this is something that I believe most of most Americans are not aware of. In fact, I'd say 98% of Americans are not aware of it. You guys at Young Turks uh, do a great job of making this connection between the private prison corporation and the egregious number of people that we have in prison in the United States, which I believe is more than any other country combined or some sort yes. of ridiculous statistic like that? Yes, let me give you some numbers. Uh, so there are 1.6 million people in state and federal prisons in the United States as of uh, December of 2010. And however, if you look uh, at private facilities, that number is 128,195. By the way, when you hear the word private, you think, oh, they fund themselves. No, they're not really private because they're using taxpayer money to run their facilities. So it's a really big problem. Dave, uh, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, do you feel that this is just one of those issues where it'll continue to get worse and no, no justice will be served? Well, first off, it's great to see Kanye using yeah. his art to say something. That's the most important thing that an artist can do, whether you're a singer, a rapper, a comedian, or a sculptor. So that, that's great. Um, I think in terms of the prisons, the, the easiest thing we could do is stop locking people up for simple drug offenses, and especially marijuana. Yeah. Um, you know, even where I live, they just, where marijuana is sort of legal here in California, I'm still a little confused because I guess it changes every day. But two blocks away from my apartment, they just had a, a federal raid on the, uh, on the legal dispensary. And this is happening constantly. I mean, you turn the news on here all the time and this is happening. So all that kind of stuff would just be a simple way to start. Let's start with nonviolent crimes, people that are often using this stuff for, for health benefits. And even if it's not for health benefits and it's just for recreational use, that's not so bad either. So I think that would be just like an easy way to start the conversation at least. Absolutely, I mean we have two states in the US uh, that voted to legalize marijuana, not just for medicinal use, but also recreational use. And of course those laws uh, do not mesh well with our federal laws, uh, but the question is what the Obama administration will do uh, with those two states going forward. Uh, Peter, I wanna bring you into this conversation. Do you think that it's effective for, for a rapper to raise awareness about these issues, or do you think that most people are just gonna see this and say, whatever, it's Kanye West, he got Kim Kardashian pregnant, no one cares what he has to say? Right. No, I, I think it's, it's hugely effective uh, to have artists raising these issues. I mean, Kanye reaches uh, you know, an audience that, that doesn't read the New York Times, doesn't watch Young Turks, um, mm. and, and to have him raise those issues it, uh, it is great. And I mean, we've all seen you know, uh, this week with Angelina Jolie and, and uh, you know, the way that she came out and, and talked about her own personal decisions, how, how celebrities, artists can in fact affect the way that, that society thinks about these issues. And it, it is a huge issue. I mean, Corrections Corporation of America is, uh, you know, recently basically sent letters around to, to state, almost every state in the country, offering to buy up prisons on the condition that, that the prisons uh, guarantee that they would retain 90% occupancy for the next 20 years. And to have that kind of financial incentive to throw people in jail and to have punitive drug laws, uh, I, there's a real conflict with our, our public interest. And there is specific legislation that you can tie back to the private prison industry. Uh, SB 1070 in Arizona is a perfect example of that. And you're seeing more and more immigrants getting um, sent to these for-profit prisons as opposed to just getting you know, sent back to the country that they came from, right? Why is it that we have to keep them here for years on end and spend tax dollars on them? That doesn't make any sense. The reason why we do is because these Pri private prisons have lobbied to make it so. It's classic rent yeah. seeking, you know, where you have a corporation that says, I want to get this government contract so that I will continue to get my payments every month, you know, like you would get for rent, uh, so that I can continue to have these, you know, respectable and completely established profits that will never go away, because once these contracts are signed, they're very difficult to get eliminated. But, you know, this is the whole point of globalization, essentially. You know, the idea that, you know, the, the whole point of globalization for corporations is to not have to pay a living wage to Americans. So they moved overseas. Well, you know, the other part about globalization and being a corporation is you have to continuously show increased profits. Well, for increased profits, something's got to give that's going to be wages 
they have this incentive to use the prison population as captive labor, which they can do for cheaper prices. I don't know what they're going to do when the captive labor becomes too expensive for them. But the incentives, the financial incentives, are too strong right now, and the, we have to fight against this as well to prevent this from becoming even more pervasive than it already is. Absolutely, and you know, I, I want to make one last point about this. One argument that uh, private prisons will make is that they save states money, but there have been numerous studies indicating that that is not the case. There was one study in Ohio that showed that they're actually costing the state more money because what they will do is they will cherry pick which prisoners they will put in their facilities. If someone is old, if someone has health issues, they will not accept those prisoners, right? They get funded by the state, so it's not like it's a really a private company. And at the same time, uh, the public prisons are stuck with the sickest uh, prisoners and of course taxpayers have to pay even more for that so it doesn't save money it, it leads to tough on crime legislation which ends up locking up nonviolent uh, offenders so I love that Kanye brought attention to this issue I hope that young people are paying attention because we do have to fight back against this now uh, conservatives seem to hate the health care mandate but what about a gun mandate let's take a look one U.S. town is taking the gun control debate to a whole new level. The town of Nelson, Georgia is home to 913 people. Now every one of its residents is required to own a gun and ammunition in their homes. The city council of five voted unanimously in favor of the measure yesterday. Seems like a bold move in the wake of the recent push to control firearms in the United States. Turns out most people there already have a gun in their home. And crime there is so low that the Georgia town only has one police officer. The bill will likely not be enforced as it is more symbolic in nature than anything else. Now, this type of symbolic legislation was also pr pr uh, proposed and passed in Nucla, Colorado. So now we have another city uh, that is trying to make a point about guns and how everyone should have one. It's kind of incredible, Dave. I mean, why is it that... <laughs> Americans don't care so much about protecting the Fourth Amendment, but they care a lot when it comes to the Second Amendment. This is so crazy at so many levels. First off, isn't it the NRA that always says the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun? Well, in that piece we just saw, they just said they have virtually no crime and they only have one cop. So this basically seems like the safest town in America, so then why does everyone need the guns? If they said, well, zombies are taking over, I watch Walking <laughs> Dead, then yes, everyone needs a gun. But to have a, a it, there, it's, the logic is completely antithetical. To say there's no crime, you should all have a gun, it just doesn't make sense. But it shows you that the debate has devolved to the point where it's like, you're either for this or against it. It's a very George Bush way of thinking. So you're either for it or against it, so you better stock up on guns, even if there's no reason to do so. I mean, it's crazy because, I mean, doesn't this go against the personal liberty that they're always <laughs> preaching about? Because this is anti-liberty. This is forcing you to do something that you may not really want to do. Now, they are saying that they're not going to enforce it. I get it. You guys are going to make that point. I totally understand that. Uh, but, Peter, doesn't this kind of go against what they're really for? Uh, or what they claim they're for? It certainly goes against, uh, you know, the basic concept of liberty and as being able to do as you please, and uh, certainly other constitutional guarantees. If you look at the freedom of speech, that has always been interpreted to include the freedom not to speak, so government can't compel you to speak, or, or freedom of religion. That always in has been interpreted to include atheism and to protect the right not to practice a religion. So uh, it's interesting that, that um, advocates of the Second Amendment would, in at least these particular advocates, um, would choose to to f compel people to, uh, to own a gun as well. I, I can't imagine that that would actually uh, be constitutional unless they have so many exemptions for, for people who have religious objections to violence um, as to make it uh, essentially toothless. Now, uh, the NRA would make the argument that people on the terrorist watch list should still be protected under the Second Amendment. They should still have the ability to have a gun. I mean, it, it's so, Desi, is it really about safety or is there something else at play here? Well, as far as, you know, this particular, these two little towns, I don't know what their problem is, so I'm assuming that it's a strictly ideological point that they're trying to make here, right. because, you know, they can no more, I would think, no more force you to own a gun than they can uh, take your gun away from you without cause. So, you know, as somebody who, you know, I support the Second Amendment, because I support all of the amendments, you know, I think they're all <laughs> great, and they don't, shouldn't, you know, they, one doesn't cancel out another, and I do find that there's a lack of, let's say, logic 
uh, that comes with uh, some of the, the more uh, fringe elements of the Second Amendment supporters. You know, I don't know why this particular town decided that they had to have this in place. Maybe they want to not have to pay for a police officer's salary and insurance and pension anymore. So The one guy. The one no guy. Crime. They yeah. only got the one guy. They have no crime, but, you know, maybe they don't feel like paying that money anymore. Maybe, uh, maybe there is some... Uh, effort from the gun industry to say, hey, you know, why don't you guys do this too and maybe we can make even more profits from people getting scared that we're going to take away their guns. You know, it seems to me completely illogical. Yeah, and it's really unfair because you have, you know, so-called gun nuts that are very extreme in their views and then you have people who are very, like, they're nuanced and you realize, they, they realize that there is some logic and there is, uh, there are reasonable gun control proposals, like background checks, just making sure that guns don't end up in the wrong hands. Um, so I I'm not in favor of banning guns, but I definitely think gun control makes some sense. It, it, it would be ridiculous to make sure that every single person in America gets their hands on a gun. Yeah, I mean, the inconsistencies are incredible because I'm gonna guess that this is a conservative town where probably most of the people are against Ob Obamacare because they don't want the government telling you, forcing you to have health insurance, and yet they're forcing you to have a gun. Exactly. So I think this really goes to just basic distrust of government, which I think some of that is kind of healthy, but clearly these, this is, I don't think it's about the specifics of the paying the police officers. Uh, you know, I don't know, I was just sort of like, right, well, why, like, would you, why would you do this? Because it, it seems in, antithetical to the other stuff that you say that you're also against. So. Right, so it's probably not about like the little specific things and more just this general distrust of government and we gotta stock up on the guns now because if you go on Drudge Report or Alex Jones's website every day, the government's coming for your guns. Right. I mean, I, I do, I will say that if I had a pistol or something, I would feel a lot safer against like these uh, weaponized drones, <laughs> you know? I, I would definitely fight back against the government. The oh, definitely, <laughs> you know. Anyway, uh, all right, well, we're out of time. We gotta take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna talk about injuries in the NFL and what we can do about it. Welcome back to The Point. Well, is the NFL really the no future league? Every year, over 100,000 concussions occur in all levels of football. And 60% of these are from head-to-head -head collisions in an impact lasting just 15 milliseconds, a player's head, on average, experiences almost 100 Gs of force. And collisions on special teams can result in forces of up to 190 Gs. In the NFL, the average speed of a head-to-head -head impact, the velocity of both heads combined, is 20 miles per hour, with the struck player's head decelerating 14 miles per hour. According to studies done by sports science's chief medical advisor, Dr. Basil Aish, this 15 millisecond impact is equivalent to getting smashed in the head with a sledgehammer. That was a difficult video to watch. And, um, you know, concussions are often talked about uh, when it has to do with the NFL and injuries that some of these athletes have to deal with. Uh, but the Washington Post did a survey of retired NFL players, and they found out a lot of really incredible information about the other injuries that these athletes had to deal with for the rest of their lives. So uh, a Washington Post survey of retired NFL players found that nearly 9 in 10 report suffering from aches and pains on a daily basis, and they overwhelmingly, 91%, uh, connect nearly all their pains to football. Nine in 10 said that they're happy they played the sport, but fewer than half would recommend their own children play it today. Nine in 10 former NFL players report suffering concussions while playing, and nearly six in 10 reported three or more. Two in three uh, who had concussions said they experienced continuing symptoms for them. And the list goes on and on. I mean, they go through uh, a lot of you know, physically taxing uh, games, and as a result, they have to really pay for it for the rest of their lives. Uh, Dave, you know, what do you think about the extent of these long-term um, health issues, and, and is it really worth the trade-off? They'll make the argument that, hey, you know what, I made enough money to take care of my family, and that's just the trade-off. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's not worth the trade-off because I think the craziest number that you just said there was that less than half would tell their children to do it. Keep in mind, this is a job where these people are making millions of dollars if not multi-millions, then at least six figures. The lowest end guys are making six figures. So when you think about that and that they're still telling their kids not to do it, it's kind of fascinating. 
I think that this, unfortunately, is one of those things that is not gonna go away because even as the technology around the helmets and the padding and all that stuff advances and gets better, our athletes are still getting stronger. And as they use human growth stuff and steroids and all this other stuff, and that which will keep getting more legal, actually. I know, you know it's getting out of the game now, but I think ultimately all of this stuff that can enhance us, especially in athletics, is gonna become more mainstream over time. Um, it, it's not gonna balance itself out. This is just gonna be, and it's, it's our way of getting our aggression. People watch football to get their aggression out. Yeah. So there are going to be repercussions around the guys that are doing it. Bread and circuses is essentially what you're saying yeah. here, is that you know we have to keep the populace uh, engaged and uh, release all of their stress and tensions by being able to watch these you know men at war down on the field on the gridiron so they can fight to get out all of that. And yet there is this long-term problem that we have all helped to create for these uh, players. Yeah, granted, they do get paid a lot of money, but I don't know that they get paid the amount of money to uh, compensate for their lifetime of injuries. And you know, the workmen, the journeyman players, you know, they that six-figure income, I don't know if that's enough to sustain them when they have the body of a, of a 70 year old or a 65 year old when they're in their late 30s and they'll need a lifetime of medical care. And this country is not set up for that and neither is, I don't think the players union has anything, any kind of uh, protection for them, yeah. do they? You know, if you think about like Rome and in the Colosseum, this is such a modern problem that we have because they got it out because a guy would get mauled by a lion so you didn't have to worry about his long-term health. Exactly. Or he his, have his head killed. chopped off. Yeah, right. exactly. So, we still need that, that part of us is still human to us, but yeah, dealing with like the long-term stuff, well, back in the day, they just didn't have to think about it. Yeah, well, in terms of compensation, uh, rookie football players can make as little, and I say little because of the context of this conversation. Obviously, professional athletes make a lot of money, but rookie players enter the league making about $400,000 a year, and some of them don't get to the level where they're making millions of dollars, so they get so injured while they're rookies that that's the payoff. I mean, you get you know a couple hundred thousand dollars and then your career is done because you've suffered a serious injury. Another problem that you know comes up often in the NFL is your contract will say, you know, if you don't play every single game, you're not going to get paid. So if you do get injured, you know, you have to tough it out and go through with it. And it's just a really bad way to, um, or it's the worst way to treat your body. Uh, Peter, what are your thoughts? Like, what is an ACLU uh, lawyer's perspective on this story? I don't think the ACLU ha exactly has a position uh -huh. on uh, <laughs> NFL injuries. I mean, uh, but I do think one of my concerns is is not just the the issue with professional NFL athletes. I mean, obviously there should be more studies and, and you know, transparency. Yeah, that's an ACLU issue. Uh -huh. um, uh, about exactly how how these injuries are being caused and how serious they are. But I think you know one of the, one of the concerns is is the the injuries and potential for injuries at lower levels, at, at the non-professional levels, like college, high school, you know, even you know, middle school football. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of injuries are are kids and uh, being exposed to by their parents, their schools that are having them? play these sports. How, how should this impact uh, a fan's enjoyment of the sport? Should it have an impact at all? I mean, I think we all we all like to think when we're rooting for our teams that, that you know, we love our players. We like to think that they're being treated well, that they love the game, and that they're not, um, you know, uh, going to come upon a lifetime of, of pain and injury uh, as the result of our enjoyment. So I, I think that, you know, it is going to affect the way people watch. But there's also a difference, though, between watching a football game and someone getting crushed, and then they're laying there because they're in uh, they're in padding. You know what I mean? They're in a helmet. You actually don't see them. If you watch a basketball game and like that guy Kevin Ware, who had that horrible leg injury, yes. like you saw it so graphically because he's in. You see, you actually physically see more of his body, and I think that also changes it. There's something that you can kind of disassociate with the football players because you can't really see them. Or the hockey players, you really never see their faces. So they get slashed or they get crushed and it's like, it's almost like you're watching a robot or, or a video game or something instead of a, an actual person. So is there a solution to all of this? I mean, we can't ban the NFL. We can't ban football. Americans love it so much. And I'm not even saying that we should ban it, but what should the solution be? I mean, the nature of the sport is pretty violent. I mean, that's just the way it is. You, yeah. They tackle each other, they jump on top of each other. 
Well, I think it depends on more information. You know, as yeah. as we're hearing more about these uh, these issues, you know, that I don't think anybody really even considered at any great length uh, before these reports all came out. So, so that's good. I think getting the fans interested, the fans will probably be the ones to lead this conversation because if they actually do care about the people that entertain them uh, in in professional athletics, that they will actually want to do something about that. I think that, that most Americans don't want people to be hurt on their behalf for entertainment. I really don't believe that when you ask them and when they think about it, they would prefer that that to happen. The disassociation, you know, it makes it easier. You don't have to think about what you're doing or the consequences of the choices that you make. But um, given the opportunity, I think most Americans would want to be on the good side of uh, making sure that these people have some sort of protection. I, I actually don't think people care. I, I really don't think people care. Look yeah, at, I look think at, better of look them at, than you do. Well, I think we do. Intellectually, we all do. Nobody, if you ask the average person, do you want to see your favorite football player you know, be a, a vegetable when he's 60? Of course they're going to say no. But look at Muhammad Ali. I don't know that they've ever directly connected, I think he has Parkinson's, to being punched in the head constantly. But we still bring him out as if it's this amazing thing, but like this thing that we love, we, wa we love watching get punched, and look what happens. So, I, I just don't see that we're going to suddenly have this mass revelation and be like, no, no more football. Well, I don't know. Maybe or, with more information, that is because you know we didn't have that information with Muhammad Ali during the heyday of his career. People sort of made the connection, but maybe not. And now we have that data, and as the data piles up, I think it will become an inescapable conclusion. I, I think that you know the point that you and Peter are making about the flow of information is a very good point. I think it's important, um, but I will say that I I agree with Dave. I'd like to believe <laughs> that people would care, but People are very interested and, and self-absorbed. Like they're self-interested and self-absorbed. And I know that that's a very yeah. mean thing to say, but it's the truth. I mean, the information about the concussions has been out there for a while, and nothing has changed so far. But you know, maybe I'm being way too pessimistic, and something will change. Anyway, it's not just the NFL that's destroying people's lives. It turns out that Florida is going to uh, press charges against an 18-year-old who had a same-sex relationship. Let's take a look. The biggest stories trending on the Huffington Post today comes from Florida, where 18-year-old high school senior Caitlin Hunt is fighting expulsion and criminal charges for a lesbian relationship with another student. Caitlin has been charged with two felony counts of, quote, lewd and lascivious behavior on a child 12 to 16 after the parents of her 15 year old girlfriend pressed charges earlier this year. Caitlin Hunt's mother, Kelly Hunt Smith, insists that the girls had a mutually consenting relationship and alleges her daughter's accusers never mentioned they had a problem with the lesbian relationship. In a statement posted to Facebook, Kelly Hunt Smith says, quote, they were out to destroy my daughter. They feel like my daughter made their daughter gay. Nearly 40,000 people have signed a petition calling on the assistant state attorney, Brian Workman, to drop the case. All right, so what I found fascinating about this story is they were dating when Caitlin was 17 years old. Uh, there didn't seem to be a problem then, uh, but as soon as she turns 18, the parents of Caitlin's girlfriend go to the authorities and she, she's facing uh, charges, criminal charges, including uh, lewd and lascivious acts. Uh, so, I mean, they are going to destroy her life if she does get convicted of this. And she will be, she's been offered a plea deal, which includes two years of house arrest. Uh, and she will be on probation for a significant amount of time. And she will be listed as a sex offender for the rest of her life. Now, Desi, what do you think is really going on here? Is this really about uh, statutory, statutory rape, or is it more about uh, same-sex relationships? Oh, I think it's, I think you're, I think you're right that it's ideologically motivated that the parents of the teenager in question uh, that they are against uh, homosexual marriage and against you know homosexuals existing at all and they wanted to lay in wait essentially until she turned 18 so that they could then go after her and ruin her life because they disagree with who she is um, and I don't think that uh, this this case should have gone through at all I think this is is very close to being a prosecutorial misconduct case because there while there isn't a whole lot of, uh, of case law I would imagine about uh, same-sex relationships and whether that statutory rape, we're probably going to find out a lot more of these. But I think that the parents and the prosecutors are probably uh, pursuing this case in order to make ideological points and to punish people for being gay. So, Peter, I just, go ahead, jump in. Just wanted to jump Hello. in. You know, it's not, we've seen this before. The ACLU has uh, seen this issue before of, of rules that give, whether it's prosecutors or school administrators, broad discretion uh, to enforce against the romantic and sexual activities of kids get used against uh, same-sex relationships. So whether it's this case or actually our office recently sent uh, a letter to a school district that was enforcing the anti-PDA uh, rules in the school preferentially against 
uh, same-sex couples. So you know, while heterosexual couples are pawing each other in the hallway, um, if same-sex couples who are holding hands or you know giving a peck on the cheek would be uh, would be so, disciplined. But it's also, it also I'm sorry, but it's also been used in other states for interracial relationships. Remember, yeah. there was a case a couple of years ago of some 18-year-old student who, once he turned 18, they he was a black student and he was he had a white girlfriend and they went after him when they didn't go after other students who were the same race yeah. for the same thing. You don't see even enforcement of these laws. There's no, no. question about that. But I actually want to have a, a broader discussion about what happens when you have two teenagers let's say one is 16 and one is 17, and then one of them turns 18, the older one, um, and then uh, you know the parents can press charges for statutory rape, and then that person can be listed as a sex offender for the rest of their lives. I mean, are our uh, sexual assault and rape laws so cut and dry that people can't make human judgments about these situations? Well, I mean, that is a problem. I mean, the, these laws criminalize and impose the draconian penalties that you, you talked about earlier. Uh, conduct that, you know, whether parents approve of it is, is fairly common among kids. And it's really a matter that should be handled by kids and their parents and, you know, school officials where, where necessary and not by the criminal justice system. I mean, you know, certainly the, there are rights in our Constitution to, to basic bodily autonomy and, and to the way that, um, you know, consenting adults relate with one another. And, and those rights do ex extend to some extent. To children too, and so there's a real concern when these laws exist and and criminalize just ordinary romantic relationships. What's amazing is the plea deal doesn't sound like a plea deal yeah. at all. I mean, yeah. you, being listed as a sex offender for the rest of your life destroys your future. I mean, you can't work anywhere near a school, you can't live anywhere near a school. I mean, it's going to impact her life negatively forever. And she's doing something that, as we've already said. Many teenagers do. They, I mean, when I was 16, my boyfriend was 18. If my parents didn't like him, they could press charges against him and he would spend time in jail and he would have to uh, register as a sex offender. I don't agree with those laws. It's stupid. We have to use some human judgment. Right, but that's also why this is about a same-sex relationship very clearly because, as we've all said now, the parents did nothing. They literally waited until this girl's birthday when they knew then they could get the law enforcement involved. So, you know, the fact that we've become such a, a litigious, is that a word? Yes, litigious. litigious society, that's part of the problem here. It's part of the problem that we still are having, in a, and Florida has like a huge amount of anti-gay laws that we're still dealing with that kind of stuff. Um, but clearly, just having the arbitrary date that, okay, on this day it was okay, but tomorrow it's not. I mean, it really is crazy, and no one thinks this girl is a sexual predator, or or. These laws were intended to protect, you know, teenagers and children from, you know, statistically speaking, we know that it's actually much older men that prey upon teenage girls, you know, statistically speaking. So the idea that these laws were supposed to protect teenagers and and children does not necessarily translate to them being applied uh, equally to everyone. And so when they uh, they have this kind of broad issue that they're able to be uh, applied unequally and according to ideological preferences so that they can be used to punish people rather than to protect people. You know, we have this more awareness is useful in this case, but I think we also have to have, uh, you know, better trained prosecutors and more active Department of Justice to well, prevent what, also, this from happening. What happened to just basic civility in parenting? Like, forget the same sex part of this for a second. If you had a kid and they were doing something you didn't want them to do with another kid that you knew about in the neighborhood, maybe you would talk to the parents. These people deliberately did not do that so right. that they could get the legal system involved. And so the prosecutor helped sick. them. And That's the prosecutor helped them. The prosecutor is helping them at this. Well, uh, thankfully, there are numerous groups that are rallying in support of Caitlin. Anonymous is one of them, and you do not want to mess with Anonymous. Uh, I'm not saying I'm in favor of vigilante justice, but they did great things when it came to the rape in Steubenville, Ohio. So uh, we will fill you guys in, in the story, uh, on the story as it develops. But in the meantime, we got to take a quick break, and when we come back, off their feed. Hey guys, welcome back to Off Their Feed, where we will take uh, some popular tweets of the week and we will dissect them and talk about them. First tweet comes from New York Times reporter Stephen Greenhouse. He said, Apple avoided billions in taxes through mind-boggling web subsidiaries. Some subsidiaries had no employees. Dave Rubin, what do you think? I jealous. That's with a little I and then a capital J. I'm jealous. I want subsidiaries. 
The tax code built for that system working as designed. Uh, I would say, why are we surprised? When we make it easy to take advantage of the system, a corporation will take advantage of the system. Uh, media critic and columnist uh, Dan Gilmore says, I hope it's finally dawned on Fox News folks why they should have stood with WikiLeaks, not against it. He's basically referring to uh, how the government went after WikiLeaks aggressively, and now the same type of behavior is being applied to uh, Fox News reporter Jason Rosen. Desi, what do you think? Uh, not a chance. Fox's institutional memory is erased daily by Roger Ailes. Going after reporters for reporting, for getting sources to provide them information, is a grave threat to the First Amendment and the freedom of the press. Uh, fair and balanced occasionally, maybe they'll start doing the right thing here. Yeah, well, no one is immune to abuses of power. Karma is a bitch. <laughs> uh, Democratic strategist Carl Frisch says, hey media, if you're talking about horribly destructive tornado near Oklahoma City, don't discuss role, hashtag climate change, may have had, hashtag psi. It would be nice when uh, people just listen to the science. I'm going to retweet that one, yeah. Oh, I love that, yeah, <laughs> retweet. Yeah. Um, as climate scientist Kevin Trenberth says, it is irresponsible not to discuss climate change in this context. All right. Al Jazeera English uh, web show, The Stream, says, what if boys got pregnant? And then he puts up uh, a link that will take you to uh, these new ads that were put up by uh, authorities in Chicago. They're trying to uh, raise awareness about pregnancy, and they're trying to convince boys to also keep in mind that if they get a girl pregnant, they're going to have to take responsibility as well. Well, I'm actually three months pregnant, and I've been waiting to announce it. So uh, there you go. <laughs> Does he? Ew. <laughs> That's all I had was ew. Theater. I think it's a creative way to address uh, a really ingrained gender discrimination in our society. Fair enough. I think it looks like the boys just ate too much roast beef. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard to take it seriously, but I think they have the right intentions. Yeah. The Atlantic tweets, uh, men's biceps predict their political ideologies, and then they link a study. Now, the study indicates uh, that upper body strength is correlated to opposition to wealth redistribution. Desi. Uh, that study also found that great wealth also correlates to opposition to wealth distribution. I think my biceps prove I have very moderate political views. Moderate, okay, <laughs> all right, all right. I think this explains some of my problems at the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the study fails to explain uh, people like Mitch McConnell, John Cornyn, John Barrasso. I mean, they're not exactly the strongest looking dudes on the planet, but they are pretty wealthy. So Desi mm -hmm. makes a great point. Yep. HuffPost DC Bureau Chief Ryan Grimm says, Mitch McConnell fighting Dems to legalize hemp, possibly my favorite Senate story ever. Uh, McConnell and Rand Paul are leading the effort to legalize hemp, uh, and that's against uh, the opposition by Senate Judiciary Chairman Pat Leahy, and he's a Democrat. Wow, Republicans for something good. First good idea they've had since, um, McConnell, hemp, let's party. I'll take common sense drug policy wherever I can find it. All right, I love it, I love it. Ricky Gervais tweets, uh, at MTV News, uh, Beyonce, Rihanna, and Katy Perry send prayers to Oklahoma, pray for Oklahoma, and then he comments to that and says, I feel like an idiot now, I only sent money. And of course, he's bringing attention to the fact that, yeah, maybe money will help people a little more than just sitting there and praying for them. Uh, yeah, prayers are their preferred alternative for people too cheap to send money. I disagree, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of people in this country for whom prayers are important and, and for whom sending prayers or, or being in the thoughts of others is, is meaningful. But money would help. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, money would help them more than prayers right at this moment. All right, and then final tweet is from Kim Kardashian. She tweets, love that I can gradually build the perfect bronze glow I want. Hashtag Kim Kardashian sunkiss tan extender with bronzers. The reason why we're showing that tweet is because it pissed a lot of people off. Apparently she tweeted that as uh, the tornado was happening in Oklahoma. People were dying, but she sends out this tweet and it seemed um, a little insensitive. This is why I'm not on Twitter. Oh, okay. OMG, so don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And you can always follow me on Twitter. <laughs> All right. Well, that does it. That does it for today's Off Their Feet. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. We had covered a lot of, ba uh, a lot of topics here. Uh, special thanks to our panelist, Peter Biebring. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, spending some time with us and having these great discussions. Thank you. Where can the audience learn more about you? Uh, on the web, uh, aclu-sc.org. Excellent. Dave Rubin? 
Thank you. Thank you. You're on every week, uh, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, I'm out there. Where am I going here? <laughs> YouTube.com slash Ruben Report. Perfect. And Desi Doy, thank you for joining us yet again. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, and you can find me at uh, greennews.bradblog.com. Uh, it's a feature we offer at bradblog.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at Green News Report. Perfect. And of course, special thanks to our point contributor this week, uh, Trevor Tim of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm Anna Kasper, and you guys can check me out on the Young Turks Monday through Friday at youtube.com slash TYT Live. I go on from 7 to 8 p.m. Pacific time, and uh, we will see you guys next week with another great episode of The Point. Have a great week.